co-founder and his friend, Alex. I think as we move to today's conversation, uh, immunity is obviously a very, very timely topic and something on, on all of our minds. Uh, and it's interesting because uh, here at TB12, we think a lot about redefining human performance and proving that age is just a number, giving people the opportunity to be their best for as long as they can. And in an environment where our health is compromised, it's real hard to do that. And we talk a lot about making small choices, lots of small choices, which can be big choices. And thrilled to have Dr. William Lee with us here today, who I'll introduce in just a moment. Uh, before I start, from an administrative and housekeeping standpoint, uh, if you could put your Zoom on mute, that would be great. And we're also going to be opening up group chat so you can pose questions at the end of Dr. Lee's presentation. Uh, I know I've got a few questions for him, but would like to see if there's some questions uh, from the audience that we can pose to him as well. Um, now, on to uh, the guest of honor, Dr. William Lee, who uh, has an extraordinary reputation. He's a world-renowned physician and scientist. He's the author of Eat to Beat Disease, which as I was saying a little while ago for people who are just starting, I actually read this book on vacation last summer, last July and August, and it's been on my mind for a lot of reasons. Um, he's had an impact on over 70 diseases. He's best known for leading the Angiogenesis Foundation. Uh, he's got a TED Talk that's uh, called Can We Eat to Starve Cancer that has been viewed over 11 million times. And I think a great opportunity today to learn from Dr. Lee, a little bit about immunity, some of the choices we can make. And also importantly, he just published a paper last week he was telling us about uh, just a little while ago on COVID. So we may pick up some interesting information there as well. So without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to you, Dr. Lee, and uh, look forward to hearing more from you and hoping to get a chance to answer, ask some questions uh, at the end of the presentation. Well, thank you very much. Uh, uh, it's really a pleasure to speak about this very important topic uh, as we uh, all are navigating with the same set of concerns about our health, which has really been redefined in the COVID era because a couple of months ago, uh, the entire world, every human on this planet had their lives up upended by something we didn't expect, which is the pandemic that um, came out of the blue, uh, took over uh, and, and really put us back uh, into our homes, uh, hiding out, uh, waiting for us to figure out when it's actually safe to come out again, which hopefully is going to start emerging soon. The safety part can't be overemphasized because we are not sure we don't understand everything about this virus yet, but we're starting to actually um, peel away uh, a little bit. So what I wanted to do is to share with you my role as, as a physician, as a scientist, uh, and as an author, what are we learning about COVID and what are we learning about that that tells us, informs us how to actually lead a better, healthier lifestyle when it comes to immunity and our diet? Because our diet's the one thing that we can all control. So with that, I'm gonna share my screen and just show you a couple of pictures that you may not have seen before. And uh, the first thing is this blob in the center of the screen. For those of you who um, you know, are uh, fitness experts or who have ever done any kind of competitive <clears throat> activity, visualization of the goal is important. And this black dot is, is really our opponent. This is actually the virus the SARS-CoV-2 virus that causes uh, uh, COVID-19. If you go lean back and squint, you'll actually see the little spikes around that black um, splotch that actually is the way that the virus actually sticks to our cells. Now, having said that, the reason that this is so important and is really underscored by the fact that there are more than 5.7 million cases of COVID-19 today. It's gonna be 6 million by the time this weekend rolls around. That is an enormous number of people affected around the world. And in the U.S., <clears throat> we'll probably round the bend of 2 million cases uh, by the beginning of next week. So this, by the way, has, has affected more people than the soldiers we send into battle in Vietnam or the Korean War or even World War I from an American perspective. Uh, I want to tell you what we're learning about this that, that allows us to just jump right into action. First of all, this is a respiratory virus that's more related to the common cold than it is to the flu. Coronaviruses are the same family of viruses that cause the cold, 
And how do we get the cold? We breathe them in. Uh, so we know that when we breathe in this coronavirus, it, the battle is mostly fought in our nose with our mucus. You know, whatever you, you blow into the Kleenex normally is exactly filled with normal antibodies that you fight off this uh, virus. Uh, and when it actually kind of invades the nose, it can get down into the lungs because our nose and our throat and our lungs are actually interconnected. And that's where some of the problems actually start is when the virus gets in the lungs that this respiratory virus causes a respiratory problem. So you can already see the opportunities to actually intercept this opponent. Uh, we, get, we have to really kind of block it at the, at the level where we might breathe it in. And that's why we actually have been uh, following this uh, rather um, awkward uh, phenomenon of wearing face masks. We can't let this virus kind of get into our nose. We don't want to blow it into other the air so other people have it. This is going to be our new reality for the time being. And also social distancing. It's really better said physical distancing because nobody wants a social distance. We actually want to pull back together now that the company is starting to open up. The country's going to start to open up, but we want actually to make sure that we have enough physical distance to remain safe so we're not actually accidentally um, throwing this virus and, and getting it from one another, especially when we go into crowded, uh, more crowded places. And obviously, where you want to head back into is be able to celebrate life again. That really is the, when we actually know we've won this battle, is when we can actually get back into celebration. There's going to be a new normal, but we want to be able to celebrate our life with wellness and be fit, and also to be able to do all we can do Although I have to say this great pause has given me, and I think many other people perhaps watching this, a time to ask an important question, which is what really matters? And I think what really matters is our health and how we actually conduct ourselves and what kind of lifestyle we can actually lead. Pandemics, this is what we're actually dealing with, are not a new thing. In human history, over 200,000 years, you know, since we kind of like stopped dragging our knuckles, and started forming communities and cities and, and, and building the communities that we, we now enjoy, uh, we've actually had periodic pandemics that have also put us on our backs. And this is actually a picture from more than 400, almost 400 years ago. Um, in Venice, Italy, there was a gigantic plague that started to whip around the city and it drove everybody and their families back into their stone houses, hiding out from the virus waiting for the town crier to say when it was safe to go back out into the square again. Sound familiar? Well, actually, that's what we've been dealing with. We, you know, suddenly realized lockdown, we've got a time to be safe, let's wear a mask. Um, when, when are things gonna actually return to normal? Well, there is a difference between the plague from, you know, the, the, the Middle Ages or the Renaissance uh, and today, and that difference is that we have science on our side. Science is what I do as a scientist. Um, I've had to help to develop more than 34 FDA approved drugs and devices using science for diseases like cancer, diabetes, preventing vision loss, and I'm also looking at cardiovascular disease. And this science is pretty powerful because it actually takes us from the dark ages into the age of enlightenment, into how it's using technology to help us. And if anybody's heard about food as medicine, I'm gonna, not gonna talk about the medicine side because that's actually what we're waiting for is doctors to actually come up with those uh, vaccines and uh, uh, treatments. I'm gonna talk about the food part of how science is actually teaching us about nutrition. Uh, last week, uh, an article was published on the research I had done recently on uh, in the New England Journal of Medicine. This is really kind of like the banner publication for important research. And what we discovered is that this, vast, this uh, respiratory virus, when it gets in the lungs, makes a beeline for our blood vessels in our lungs. And in fact, we have the first pictures showing um, uh, the virus filling up our blood vessels cells uh, like a gumball machine. And once that actually happens, you damage your circulation. Uh, uh, the blood starts to clot because the circulation needs to flow smoothly. And we believe that this is actually the start of understanding why we're affecting the brain, why we're affecting our legs, why we're getting COVID toe, um, heart issues. And the startling thing about this discovery is that if COVID actually starts in the lungs but can affect the rest of our body, it can really impair our fitness even after we've overcome the virus. There could wind up becoming a residual complication of having compromised circulation. 
The circulation is important for our muscles, for getting back in the shape. And think about anybody you know who may have been a positive for COVID, who's had the disease, how difficult it has been for them to bounce back. We think that this is partly explained by the effect it has on the microcirculation. So this is actually my wheelhouse. I study blood vessels and how to keep them in good shape. And this is something that is really setting the stage for future research. So what are we gonna do? What can we do for ourselves? Well, we're waiting for a vaccine. We're waiting for effective treatments. We have our immunity. Um, and what we have been doing is avoiding the virus uh, and hiding. So hiding is no longer an option. We need to be able to lean forward and get back to take control of our lives. Avoiding, well, you know, the mask, the physical distancing, the avoiding large crowded spaces, you know, just being, having situational awareness, um, as they call it, is actually just an important thing. But since we're still waiting for a vaccine or effective treatments, we got immunity. That is us. We are born with our own health defenses, with, of which immunity is one of them. And I wanted to actually share with you what we can do now, uh, which is to boost our own defenses in this epic battle, bat battle between uh, our body and a virus. So this is a, basically you know, um, a, a struggle that we're actually having. So it's time to shore up, to get in the shape, to be as fit as possible, and not just, you know, um, stuff ourselves with junk food or processed foods. You know, this is not, we're, this, we're not in a world war where, you know, we're eating rations. We can get fresh food, we can exercise, we can do what we can to get rest, good sleep and lower our stress, all important things for our immunity. And what I want to actually focus on is how food, our nutrition, can impact our health defenses. So in my book that John talked about, Eat to Beat Disease, I actually write about when it comes to food and health, it's not just about the food, it's about how our body responds to what we put into it. And how our body responds is through our health defense systems that are hardwired in our bodies from the time we're born until our very last breath, okay? And, and these are the five health defense systems I'm showing you right now. Angiogenesis is our circulation, 60,000 miles worth of blood vessels that actually bring oxygen and nutrients, what we eat, to every cell in our body. We've got our stem cells, a regeneration, so we can heal us and grow our muscles and heal our organs from the inside out. We've got our microbiome, healthy gut bacteria. We know just how important that is. It's becoming more important because we know our gut bacteria talks to our immune system to help it get into shape. DNA, much more than a set of genetic instructions. We now know that our DNA is hardwired to protect us from the environment by rebuilding itself and slowing cellular aging. And then finally, the most important system that everybody's talking about now is our immunity. And our immunity can be powerfully influenced by food. And I want to tell you how we can use food, nutrition as our medicine. So, first of all, I told you that I actually been involved with drug development. Uh, and, and one of the things that I realized having developed medicines is how important it is to prevent diseases in the first place because medicines you know, uh, are uh, expensive, and we want to be able to actually get more available, accessible things before you get sick. What are we learning about from drug development, though, that we can bring to food? Well, first thing is that there's more than 800 uh, medicines that have been FDA approved over the last 25 years. That's kind of the, the time has spent I've been involved in this game. And so the bottom line is that there's a lot of science that led to this drug development. I want to share with you what we peeled back uh, to be able to apply to food. Please don't even think you need to uh, understand this complicated uh, roadmap of the science that you want to leave to the scientists. But I can tell you, these are the systems in our body, uh, the wiring, you know, the electrical plan, the cellular plan that our foods actually activate. And so what do we actually know is that these are the kinds of things that, you know, you go to the mar farmer's market, you go to the grocery store, you see them, you know, you recognize them. How do you choose the right ones that can help our immunity? Well, we can plug, you know, scientists like me, we can plug this back into that complicated wiring diagram. And I want to basically just bring it straight to you so you don't have to think about the details. You can just focus on actually the taste, um, the way to actually integrate into your everyday life. Um, uh, and, you know, Mother Nature's done a lot of the work because she has actually laced many of the fresh foods, the whole foods, plants, um, uh, plant-based foods, mostly fruits and vegetables, nuts and legumes, with these natural chemicals that the plants use to defend their, their own health. 
and bees use them to actually pollinate uh, foods. It, it's just a wonderful way that when we start eating plant-based foods, those same defense molecules and plants have a new job description. They go to work in our bodies by uh, activating and, and, and engaging our, our own health defense systems. I want to show you something that's really quite amazing because I've actually done research to compare um, what we get out of the farm with pharmaceuticals. Food is medicine. How, what happens when you compare them head to head? Uh, on the black bar at the very top are actually cells that might be growing, for example, in cancer. And if the full bar left to right is actually what happens when you don't treat with anything. And then you can kind of see the blue and yellow bars are actually what happens when you throw medicines into the system. Yeah, of course, when you throw chemo drugs like tamoxifen in blue near the bottom against these cells, you're gonna start killing cells because that's what cancer therapies do. But check it out, when you actually throw foods into the system, look at that. Like you can see that foods go head to head against medicines and in some cases are more powerful than even cancer drugs. And so this is really the kind of work that I'm trying to do. It's not about, you know, standing on a soapbox and saying kale is good for you. Um, uh, and it's not about ideology. It's really about just looking at the evidence to see what's what in our food. Clearly, really powerful. So I want you to take home this message. When it comes to food and health, it's not just about the food. It's about how your body responds to what you put inside it. Our immunity, one of our most important uh, health defenses. Uh, I don't want to really spend too much time talking about, you know, the complexity of the immune system. Let's leave that to the immunologists. Let's leave that to the medical doctors that focus on this and the research scientists. But for the purposes of today and food and health and immunity, let's just call immunity as your immune system as really a group of super soldiers that are circulating your body that are actually designed to recognize invaders and problems and can take care of them. And just like you might expect in super soldiers. You know, you got your special forces, you got your generals, you got your um, uh, the people collecting intel and doing a recon. Um, they all work as a team to actually go out and, and, and get out there into the field to make sure the battle can be won. Very complicated uh, kind of systems, but they respond, they too need to be fed. The soldiers need to be fed. So I'm gonna tell you 10 things you can actually eat to feed your body super soldiers. And these are things that are really easy to find. I'm gonna show you this again, and so you can watch this again um, on the recap, so not to worry. But I wanna to explain to you that um, boosting your immunity in the fight against a virus is not complicated. This is something that you can put into your every single day life. Uh, vitamin C is one of those micronutrients that helps our immunity because it actually enhances our ability, our immune system, to be able to kill microbes and get rid of viruses and improve our antibodies and lower inflammation. So I'm not gonna give you a medical school lecture by any means. Um, I'm a food lover, I, I'm a foodie, I, I love to cook, I love to go out to markets, I love to eat. And if you want vitamin C, one of the best ways to get it is actually in guava. So if you go to the supermarket and you go, you know, sort of look at all the fruits and vegetables in the one aisle, you go to the next aisle, you'll see there's some of these tropical fruits like the pineapples and bananas, uh, mangoes, guava coming out now. It's grown in the tropics from the Caribbean. Um, this guava plant, which is this pink juicy stuff, you can actually, um, is actually, it's got four times more vitamin C than an orange. Uh, so it's really amazing uh, to, to, to try, to explore. You can slice it, you can eat it raw, you can actually cook it down, you can make a jam out of it, you can spread it on bread, um, you can actually uh, cook it with chicken or fish works well in the grill, just an amazing source of vitamin C to help boost your um, body's own uh, defense systems and immunity. Mushrooms, another one of my personal favorites. Um, uh, any kind of mushroom actually works. Uh, uh, this is you know, kind of like uh, different kinds of mushrooms, white button mushrooms, portobellos, baby bellas. Um, you can get fancier to shiitake. Any, bottom line is you can go to any grocery store or farmer's market and see what's out there. And mushrooms have vitamin D, which has been shown to actually support the immune system. But then there's a new booster, which is called beta-glucan. It's a kind of fiber that activates your body's immune system to create more antibodies in your saliva and your mucus. Remember I told you that's where you can actually intercept the enemy, right in your nose. Um, mushrooms will do that. And when you eat them, the, the good stuff is in the caps. But there's twice as much of the good stuff. Uh, in the stems of the mushrooms. So you don't want to throw the stems away. You want to cook with the stems. And if you don't know what to do with them, you can um, 
cook them in a soup. You can actually saute them. There's so many different ways you can just go online to look up mushroom recipes and you'll find a lot of different ways to actually um, cook with mushrooms that can support your immune system. Broccoli. This is not your mom's broccoli with broccoli, you know, big, big trees of broccoli. Broccoli sprouts are out now. These are the three to four day old broccoli that are, are just have a nutty flavor. Uh, turns out that there are these great natural molecules called sulforaphanes that boost your immune system and they're 100 times concentrated in the baby broccoli. So you don't have to actually go you know, buy the trees or the frozen broccoli. You can actually just get, find the little shoots. If you're growing a garden, grow some broccoli and the sprouts are amazing. Um, uh, and this is from, there's a study that came out of North Carolina where they took young 20 year olds that were super healthy and they gave them the flu vaccine and they gave half of the, the, of the kids really a shake made with broccoli sprouts, just a couple of cups a day, uh, a couple of cups of the sprouts made into a cup of uh, the shake. And they swig that down and they measured their immune response. And it turns out that in uh, young, healthy people who had um, the, the broccoli sprouts, it amplified their immune system's response to the flu vaccine by 22 times. This is really actually how to amp up your super soldiers um, using broccoli. If you can't find sprouts, the adult broccolis are also good. If you, um, uh, most people eat the treetops, but the, actually the stem, we've studied this in research, have twice the amount uh, of good stuff that the stem, that, that, the, that the true florets have, the treetops. So save those, for, uh, the stems, just like the mushrooms, find something to do with it, saute them, turn them into a smoothie. You can cook them with a soup. There's a lot of different um, recipes. So again, 22 times more killing power um, against the virus. This is all human studies. Um, uh, olive oil, like it's not good to have too much fat of any sort, but if you're gonna actually have fat, olive oil is extra virgin olive oil has got the better kind of fat. Studies in Spain have shown that there's a natural molecule called hydroxytyrosol that activates our immune T cells. That's one of the super soldiers in our body that actually directly tackles um, uh, uh, the, the virus itself once it gets into our body. And olive oil is a great way to do it. You know, the best way to actually uh, have olive oil is, you know, uh, or that is extra virgin. And you really don't need more than a couple of uh, tablespoons a day to be able to get you what you need. Um, an interesting little side tip is that eating whole olives can do the trick as well. And if you actually squeeze the olives to get the water, the olive water out, olive oil just kind of floats on the top, this hydroxytyrosol is in the olive water. And so you want to drink olive juice. That's also a really great way to get this immune boost and stuff. Now, berries, who wouldn't want to eat something like this, right? This beautiful dark color filled with a, this beautiful natural dye. The dye is called anthocyanin. And guess what? Anthocyanins help another part of your super soldiers and natural killer cells do their job. And studies have been shown in actually athletes that if you actually have regular blueberries, like a couple of handfuls a day, your immune system is just propped up. Uh, and, and then if you work out, uh, having blueberries before working out actually keeps your immunity going. And it's sort of like the, the bonfire that keeps on burning later into the evening. That's actually what berries can actually do. Blackberries can also do have a very similar effect. So if it's dark and it's blue, it's beautiful and actually can help support your immunity. And a great way to start the day uh, in my book. Here's a surprise for you, oysters, right? Now I know the shellfish industry is suffering now because of the restaurants uh, are, are closed, but uh, it turns out that in Asia, they don't just chuck oysters and have them on a half shell. Uh, they actually cook with oysters because oysters that are not perfectly formed actually are cooked down and reduced. And in fact, it turns out into oyster sauce. Well, actually studies have been shown that if you uh, 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 test oysters against the immune system, uh, you'll actually in enlarge your immune organs, your thymus, your spleen. This is one case where size does matter and oysters can actually do that. I'm not talking about those, those organs, I'm talking about your immune organs. And, it, and for, because your immunity can kill cancer cells, it doubles the cancer killing power of, of, of your natural killer immune cells. So what if you can't get oysters? You can get uh, like living oysters, you can get oyster sauce, which is found in any Asian market. Uh, and you can actually use oyster sauce on healthy greens that you can just saute or steam. A great way to light up your flavors, got this great umami flavor. Again, I love to cook. And this is one of my go-tos when I wanna actually add a little extra pop uh, to the flavoring of vegetables. Now, I'm just gonna 
close by saying the microbiome is actually super important, right? That's our healthy gut bacteria, probiotics, so on and so forth. I can tell you that there are so many bacteria in our body that they actually uh, outnumber our, our, or they number our cells, our human cells. So we're really half bacteria and half human. By the way, a little side note, um, there's a word for an organism that's composed of multiple species um, and it's called a holobiont. And, that, and that's actually what we are. We're not just humans anymore. We're holobionts because we're mostly bacteria and mostly human cells mixed together like an ecosystem. Think about it like the Great Barrier Reef. Now, those bacteria in our gut, mostly living in our gut, um, talk to our immune system because in the last 10 years, we've discovered that our immune system, about 70% of our immune system is actually inside the walls of our intestines like a jelly roll. So the bacteria live inside, they're, they're, and then they, they're separated from our immune system, 70% of our immune system, just by the layers of our immune system. So remember in college when you had lived in the room and you knocked on the wall and you knocked and your roommate could hear every noise coming through your wall? That's what the bacteria does to our immune system. They talk to our immune system. And so when we take care of our gut bacteria, we're taking care of our immune system. And I want to share with you how we can do this. 37 trillion healthy gut bacteria in our body. How do we actually feed them as we feed ourselves? Well, it's really interesting. Pomegranate, which is also another one of my favorite, is uh, one of these fruits that actually contain that's really juicy, and it can actually, and the juice actually contains these natural dyes that feed that help our gut bacteria grow. One of the gut bacteria is called Acromantia mucinophila, and the mucinophila for, for uh, this bacteria means that this, this bacteria likes to grow in the natural healthy mucus that our intestines secrete. So when we drink, when we eat pomegranate, drink pomegranate juice, it actually helps our, our gut secrete that nice healthy mucus. And it's basically like fertilizing the soil. So this acromancy growth. This acromancy, by the way, basically um, jacks up our immune system and it actually puts into motion the super soldiers that can protect us against not only infection, but also cancer. And that's really what uh, this research um, has been all about. Um, I, I have a colleague in Paris, uh, Dr. Laurent Zipbocal, who discovered in people with cancer who are getting treated with immune therapies, if they actually had um, uh, this bacteria, Ac Acromantia mucinophila, mucus growing, super soldier supporting bacteria, um, they actually, their immune system could tackle the cancer a lot more effectively. And if it didn't have it, their immune system was weaker. How do you do it? You can't actually eat this as a, bac as a bacteria, uh, as a probiotic. You have to grow it yourself. This is DIY immunity against cancer and against uh, immune protection. So we can actually drink pomegranate juice. So here's how it works. You have pomegranate juice, you get the mucus, the mucus uh, uh, helps um, uh, uh, cradle the acromantia. Um, when the bacteria grow, they, they knock through those college dorm walls and they, they activate the immune system, and the immune system goes to town to its job. The super soldiers go to work to protecting the homeland. This is like homeland security with uh, pomegranate juice. So easy to do. I have a gla glass of it every day. Green tea, you know, uh, it, it's like hardly a situation that you can't use green tea to do something better for you. We know that the natural chemical EGCG and green tea Actually, it lowers inflammation, which is also what we want when we're, you know, um, uh, this COVID environment. We don't want inflammation, okay? But when we're working out and trying to get fit as part of our normal lifestyle, we also want to decrease inflammation after working out as part of recovery. Now, here's the latest part. There was a study out of, out of Asia that showed that people who did better had less severe COVID infections um, had more of this natural chemical called interferon gamma uh, that their body produces, natural antiviral substance. And then they found that, pe that the people who had more lactobacillus, a healthy gut bacteria, had more interferon. Then they found the people who drank more tea with EGCG had more lactobacillus, who had then had more interferon gamma. You see, can connect the dots here really easily. A cup a day actually not only lowers inflammation, it boosts your antiviral fighting cap capability. And this has been studied in COVID-19 patients on a worldwide. So this is kind of smoking hot research um, that's going on right now as well that I'm involved with. And then finally, one of my favorite uh, 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 snacks really are tree nuts. 
Um, I like them all, macadamias, walnuts, but one of my favorites are pecan, pecans because there's so many things you can do with pecans. The key thing is really to try to get the nuts and you know, you can, you can kind of um, roast them to kind of make them a little bit tastier. You can salt them a little bit. You know, be really careful about added sugar. You don't want to actually, you know, sugarize um, your whole body. But nuts are one of Mother Nature's greatest um, immune boosters because they've got the natural fiber that feeds our gut bacteria, which then talks across the college dorm walls, uh, amps up our super soldiers. And nuts are also a great source of protein. They also are a source of healthy fat. So a handful of nuts as a snack before you go on for a hike, you know, uh, in a, with safe physical distancing. This to me is a no brainer and it should be something that you can actually store in your pantry. This is by the way, a middle aisle item. So they used to talk about like avoiding the middle aisle when you go to the grocery store. What I would tell you here, there are some good things in the middle aisle, extra virgin olive oil and tree nuts. So think about those and beans are also good for you as well. Um, but again, this is the, I'll tell you the little secret here. Again, that same study in Asia, interferon gamma, virus fighting in COVID. Um, there's a bacteria called ruminococcus that actually boosts this um, interferon gamma. And guess what? You've got the ruminococcus and interferon gamma from people, that, people who are eating more polyunsaturated fatty acids, healthy fats you get in nuts, and dietary fiber. So again, this is like really state-of-the-art thinking uh, in the COVID era that informs our nutrition in, in a very specific way that have been studied in people. So again, take home. These are just 10 foods. There's a lot more in my Eat to Beat uh, Disease book. I write, write about more than 200 foods. But here's 10 that I, I try to put into my diet on a regular basis. There's a lot more. It's about diversity. It's not about one thing all the time. And more isn't better. Eating you know, sort of a moderate amount on a regular basis of all of these foods, mixing them up, finding clever ways, you know, looking on, online to finding good ways to cool recipes. Uh, that, you know, that, that to me is a hobby that's worth getting into is, you know, how do we actually eat to beat disease is actually taking mother nature's bounty, whole foods, mostly uh, 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 plant-based foods, fruits, vegetables, nuts and legumes, finding ways to actually um, build them into our everyday lives. And this to me is how to actually get into shape to run that Olympian marathon of our lives. How do we actually you know, get into shape so we can go into um, uh, the competition of our lives? Right now we're facing the greatest uh, opponents really, which is this virus. But it's, there's gonna be more. We're gonna see more viruses. We're gonna see more things. And as we get older, we have to fight the diabetes. We have to fight the cancer and the heart disease and the dementia and the obesity all the other things. So I think about life as a marathon, uh, our nutrition and foods, whole foods are at, about getting into shape and getting into that right mindset. So um, I wrote all about this, I need to beat disease. If you want to get more information, you can come to my website, drwilliamleeli.com. You can follow me on social um, at drwilliamleeli. I, have, I always try to bring out new information that's coming out on, uh, on data surrounding uh, food. I'm all about the science. I'm, you know, I, 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 I respect the ideology that comes around diets, but if we follow science, the nice thing about science that's been said is that it's true whether you believe it or not. And for here, we, we, you know, we have no room for error in terms of improving our immunity. We have to keep marching uh, forward. And what a great way to do this with healthy, delicious foods. Well, look, we really appreciate that. It was a wonderful, wonderful presentation. And uh, we've got a number of questions uh, from the group. I want to get to, to some of those. Had a few things I'd like to just dig into that you brought up and maybe one or two questions. Um, the first thing I want to say, I just very much appreciate uh, the positive and constructive tone you've taken on these issues relative to people actually having some control. Because I think one of the things that's happened with uh, the whole narrative around uh, the current environment is so many things are out of control. And the fact that you talk a lot about the choices that people can make is, is very, very important and something we believe in very strongly here at TB12. And so I really, really appreciate that. Um, I will tell you, uh, relative to choices, uh, one of the questions that we've talked about a bit is um, when you don't necessarily have access to fresh fruits and vegetables, what about things like frozen uh, fruits and vegetables or, you know, for some people canned, uh, things like that. What are, the, um, what are the puts and takes relative to nutrition uh, from fresh versus maybe frozen and canned? Right. Well, so look, uh, I think the key is to focus on the identity of the food 
whole foods, mostly plant-based foods are actually good for us. And so um, fresh of a course is best, but not everybody can get fresh as you pointed out. And it turns out that most of the frozen foods have been pretty much snap frozen. Uh, and tests have been done showing that largely speaking, the nu nutrient value is very similar in high quality frozen foods. And, uh, uh, and canned foods actually can be good as well. It turns out that, you know, if you take a look at some of the uh, uh, foods that you finally see in cans, um, that they're, they're nutrient, they're the same chemicals that mother nature laced in them stay really shelf stable, which is a good thing. What I would say though, is you wanna be careful about processed foods. When you actually have sort of uh, uh, plant-based foods that look healthy, but they're mixed in with all this other ultra processed foods. I, I know my, my own rule of thumb is that if it's in a box, be a little bit careful. Pick up the box and look at the ingredients. If it, you know, if it takes you more than a, than a couple of seconds to read the ingredients, you know there's probably too much stuff yeah. that's been made. Uh, and it's, it's ultra processed. Ultra, the ult, idea of ultra means that, you know, like if there's tongue twister chemicals on there, it's probably something that is not good, as good for you as the canned, the frozen, or the fresh. Yeah, well, it's like I said in the beginning too, Mother Nature has already done a lot of the work for us, right? So you, you can just rely on some of what's been put, put forth by Mother Nature. Uh, you know, it was interesting, when I first read your book uh, last year, one of my big takeaways was the uh, brassicas, the family of foods there, and uh, particularly broccoli sprouts, which I actually grow at home now too. So just for people that want to take some of Dr. Lee's advice, very, very simple to do. And I just clip them every day and drop them in a shake or on top of a salad. But one of the questions that I think comes up oftentimes in these things is how much? Like, so you mentioned in there, you know, a few cups, you blend it down into a smoothie. You know, I, I do a, a couple clippings and I drop it in a shake. I know it, people's biologies are different, their sizes are different, but with all these foods you talked about, could you give some sense of how people should think about portions and how much? Right, well, in my book, Eat to Beat Disease, I have a whole chapter, a whole section on food doses. And if you're gonna talk about food as medicine, in medicine, it's always about the dose, right? Like, the, like your doctor writes a prescription and tell you exactly what it needs to be. Well, we're not quite there yet with all the foods, but, I, but actually we know quite a lot about the, the rough dosing for things. So for example, we know that for the pomegranate juice, if you just drink eight ounces, which is one fluid cup a day, you'll grow some real good acromantia. And you can measure that if you check your microbiome, for example. Uh, so that's not asking a lot. Uh, uh, we know there's some amazing data uh, looking at um, nuts, and it's really just a handful of nuts a couple of times a week. Um, that, that's all you need for tree nuts. So like those pecans, two handfuls of nuts. I, I don't want to even count them out. You can actually get down to counting the nuts, but then they're different sizes. But I would just say two handfuls uh, a couple of times a week. Um, I can tell you there was a study that was done by oncologists showed that you can cut the uh, uh, the chances of death and colon cancer uh, just by adding nuts um, uh, to your to your regular diet. So this is powerful stuff. Olive oil, uh, two to three tablespoons a day. That's totally adequate to get you that hydroxytyrosol. And for berries, you know, think about um, a couple of cups. So if you got a measuring cup up and you poured blueberries or blackberries on them, you know, just think about that as kind of like something that you want to uh, uh, spread out in terms of your day, or just eat them for breakfast, or if you want to. Uh, uh, puree them down into a smoothie. My message is that it's not asking a lot. Yeah. That it's easy, super easy to do. Yeah. Well, your blueberry point is interesting. Uh, for those of uh, the viewers here who are not familiar with TB12, uh, Tom's favorite smoothie that he makes uh, is filled with blueberries. He makes it every day and has it before he works out. And it's interesting because you had mentioned, you know, uh, the benefits of before. Uh, as a as a real positive of blueberries as well. So it's definitely something near and dear to our heart. Um, one question that I think uh, was posed in the group, and I know one I had uh, when I heard you talking about pomegranate juice, because uh, I, I will tell you very candidly, one of the pieces of advice in your book that I did not take was the pomegranate juice, because I am in the camp of I'm um, worried about too much sugar and added sugar, and I know a lot of people are. So you talked about one cup of pomegranate juice. How do you feel about that trade-off between the additional sugar in a cup of juice Versus, um, versus the benefits of pomegranate juice. That is a great point, right? So there's been a lot said uh, about the role of sugar and how sugar actually can erode 
deteriorate our health. But most of the research that's been done on that sugar really relates to added sugar, you know, where you're taking refined cane sugar and you're dumping it into something. And, you know, think about your, your, your frosted cereals or whatever that we, m many of us grew up with, you know, again, ultra processed foods. Um, think about your sodas, you know, and if you were to see these pictures of how much sugar is actually in a can of soda uh, that's put in there, it is frightening. Turns out that mother nature's sugar tends to actually be more reasonable to eat. I mean, think about it, bears out there in the wild forage for berries, bears don't develop diabetes, okay? Um, yeah. and, and so mother nature's sugars, um, uh, you do have to be careful if you do have diabetes to actually limit the amount of even fruit sugar. But in general, natural fruit sugars in the fruit is probably fine. One thing that you wanna be careful of, you, the, the, the upside is that along with the sugar, the natural sugars come all these other benefits. So like everything else, life is about sort of checks and balances, uh, benefits and risks. And I would tell you pomegranate's pretty sweet, but it's got a ton of these uh, uh, polyphenols that you know are good for your gut. So um, uh, you can dilute it out, dilute it out a bit. You can add it to other things uh, uh, just to kind of, uh, you can drink it more slowly over the course of the day. And sugar, you know, it's sort of like a sugar load is what, what's important. So rather than swigging a whole cup of pomegranate juice, maybe you sip it over the course of, you know, uh, a little bit, uh, you know, read a paper or, or, or scan your, uh, check your emails, whatever, that's probably just fine. So again, you know, you wanna check with your doctor if you have, if you know you have a problem with sugar, but I would encourage people to think, don't be afraid of mother nature's sugars, At, but do ask, what else, what else am I getting? What's the fringe benefit I'm getting if I have to have some natural fruit sugars? That's great. Well, consider a cup of pomegranate juice added to my daily routine. I'm going to have to get, get that going. Um, can you talk a little bit about, you talked about 10 things that people should eat. Um, do you have a couple things, and sugar is making me think of it, but do you have a couple things that you'd say to people, hey, you should just avoid these things, even just two or three things quickly that your advice would be to stay away from? Yeah, so my 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 message is is a little bit different than a lot of people who are on diet and health because I got I got to confess with you I not only am I a scientist but I, I I'm a foodie I love to eat I, I love that adventure I love to you know the the exploration of delicious foods um, uh, and and I believe that food is tightly is very tightly connected to who we are how we grew up our families and our own individual cultures because we all come from somewhere and you know our cultural roots inform our bodies you know over generations with the kinds of things that we like to eat so my philosophy is the more good stuff we eat the more we build up our body's defenses the, more, the less room we have for bad things and by the way we also build by taking care of our home defenses we have a resiliency so we can actually our bodies will naturally be able to defend against a few you know bad habits or treats that we want to give ourselves. Um, look, human nature abhors deprivation. And when somebody <laughs> tells you no, what does your brain tell you? Ah, I'm going to sneak something. Yeah. I, want to feel, I want people to feel more confident that if you're doing good stuff for yourself all the time, as part of your fitness routine, as part of your lifestyle, you know, every now and then it's totally fine to celebrate by eating a couple of things that are not so good for you. But I want to answer your question directly. So what are the things that I would, you know, categorically say, you know, if you, if you can avoid them, definitely avoid them. Number one, um, we talked about it already, sugar, sweetened beverages like sodas. You know, as much as everyone around the world, you know, naturally thinks about slaking their thirst with an ice cold whatever, uh, you know, and that comes in a can. The reality is that that's mostly sugar. Um, it's got a lot of other chemicals into it. And there's been so many studies that show that sugar not only wrecks your, that in, from soda, wrecks your metabolism, but the latest research shows that um, sugar-sweetened beverages like sodas destroy our microbiome. They destroy that ecosystem. And it happens fast. Even after a couple of sodas, you know, the bacteria are really unhappy with what we've done to them. And part of it is going to be the huge sugar load, but also the other things that are actually uh, in the soda as well. So I would say, you know, reduce or eliminate that. Another thing that's like a, a no-brainer to me from evidence is highly processed meat. 
and you know the the stuff you would get um, uh, in a in a in a deli. Frankly, stuff that we grew up on, everyone grew up on these um, ultra processed meats. Um, uh, they've been classified in Europe uh, as uh, by the World Health Organization as a car as a class one carcinogen. We know this is tied to cancer. And again, you know, every now and then, if you're going to go out to a ball game and you're going to get something from the vendor, as long as your body is resilient and strong, you could probably take it. You know, you could take that punch. But what you don't want to be doing is doing that every single day or regularly or making that a weekend habit. That's a treat. So those would be two examples of things that I would say stay away from. That's great. That's, that's really helpful. Um, series of other questions, I think, if I could package them up all into one. Um, things like you mentioned mushrooms, the actual vegetable or fungus mushroom versus dried powdered form of it. Um, you know, if you want to get your gut health stronger, but you don't have access to, or you don't like yogurt and you want to take a probiotic pill, um, you, whatever the case may be, the, the dried or powdered form and a supplement versus the, the natural form, what are kind of the pros and cons as you think about that? Right, well, the, the advantage of a dried powdered form is that anybody can order it, you can store it, and you can have it really easily every, every day and you can kind of decide what you want to do with it doesn't need to be washed, it doesn't need to be peeled, it doesn't need to be cooked in any other way. Um, so I'm, uh, you know, I'm totally a believer in the powderized version, if, if that's what you prefer. Uh, I think the whole fresh foods are, are also um, really kind of the no-brainer um, uh, as community, right? I mean, we live on a planet that is a living planet where foods grow and we take care of them and we eat the fruits uh, of the earth. And so to me, that's the most natural way to actually exist. But we can actually get a lot of the same things from powdered and we know that there are meal replacements. They can make life a lot easier. So I'm sort of, uh, I sort of take healthy eating and sort of the mindset of the cage fighter, you know, the mixed <laughs> martial arts, you know, yeah. you got to kind of take a look at whatever style is going to work for you in the cage at the time to win that battle. Yeah. That's great. Uh, one or two last, one or two last questions, uh, if we could, uh, we'll and we'll wrap this up. Um, just you know, you mentioned green tea. Uh, we've had a few questions on that, and it's something that um, I'm a fan of personally. I use a lot. Um, if you're around me, you'll see me drink a lot of matcha green tea. So, you know, curious matcha versus regular green tea. There's a question from the group on decaf green tea. Does it have the same benefits? Uh, anything you could expand upon there? Absolutely. So. Um, like you, I love tea. I love all kinds of teas, but especially green tea. Uh, tea is the second most common beverage in the world after drinking water. Yes. Okay. So, and it's and it's in almost every culture, uh, although I think it started in Asia. Uh, and there's been lots of, of um, uh, interesting debates over is Japanese tea sencha better than other teas. So, what did I do? I went and took different teas and I studied them in drug development assays to see which ones are better. And a couple of myths got busted by me when I did my research. Number one, um, Japanese tea is great, but it's not the only powerful tea. Um, uh, uh, ja jasmine tea, which is a kind of green tea mixed with flour, also great. But I discovered even black tea is also great, like Earl Grey with a little bit of citrus, bergamot, it's great. A couple of tips about that. Um, if you put milk in your tea, you actually precipitate out, you sink to the bottom, you take out of the liquid the good stuff. So sort of, you know, like enjoy your tea uh, straight, I would say. You know, hot or cold doesn't really matter. Uh, by the way, we've studied hot tea and cold tea, both are potent. So e equal, I, the iced tea version is also good. Um, as, it, as it relates to decaf, here's the one thing that you gotta realize. Uh, when you're decaffeinating tea, what they're doing is they're, 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 the tea makers are pouring a chemical through the tea to remove the caffeine. In removing the caffeine, that solvent's also taking a lot of the good natural, poly, not natural polyphenols out of the tea as well. So you lose, along with the caffeine, wow. some of the good stuff. So that's not something you really, I mean, you'll miss that if you have it. So if you enjoy the taste of tea and you don't want the caffeine, that's fine. But again, this is, might be where you might take a dietary supplement that has you know, the green tea supplement minus the caffeine. 
Yeah. Solvents in tea does not sound healthy. So yeah. <laughs> look out for that for sure. Um, last question, uh, which I think you talked about early on and, and I'd be remiss not to ask just given your um, extensive experience and authority on angiogenesis uh, about, I think it was six to eight weeks, probably eight weeks ago now, uh, we put out what we call the TB12 immunity game plan. And one of the points we made in there, aside from things like, you know, eat more foods with vitamin C and things like that was move 30 to 60 minutes per day. And I thought your comments in the very, very beginning were interesting around that. And with your authority on, on the topic and circulation, uh, I thought it'd be interesting just to ask you maybe to um, uh, recommendation on that and the importance of movement, not just diet, but movement and how the two support each other. Right. Like food and health is just one component of your overall health. Along with food, what's really super important are, is movement, physical activity, regular physical activity, everyday physical activity. And yeah, working out is great. Having a trainer is great. Uh, getting into fighting shape uh, is, is superb if you can actually do that. Um, you know, athletes and actors have to, you know, look good and feel good and they've got to look the part. But really, no matter who you are, no matter what you do, everybody can actually spare a half an hour or maybe a little bit more to do some regular exercise. <clears throat> if you're going to do any kind of regular exercise, whether it's exercising in place, doing kind of calisthenics, workout, resistance training, or even going for a, a really brisk walk for a half an hour, get your heart rate up get your muscles moving. One of the things that comes out of my field of angiogenesis is when you exercise, your muscles want to grow because use them. Uh, uh, and so you're, you're moving, uses them. Don't use them, you lose them. But when you're actually using them, blood vessels, new blood vessel, more circulation grows into your muscles. And here's a, a little, again, I talk about these hidden fringe benefits. When you're exercising regularly, even half an hour, even brisk walking, those signals to your muscles send a, a natural kind of um, uh, uh, press a natural button that tells your bone marrow to release stem cells to regenerate your body. So part of generating bigger, better, more defined muscles, those stem cells go everywhere else and they start to regenerate your brain. They help to groom your heart. They help to comb and fi fix your other organs as well. And so just regular exercise has been shown to improve longevity, slow cellular aging, improve your immunity, and of course, get you in tip top shape. That's great. Well, you know, really appreciate your time today. And I think uh, particularly, you know, when Tom and Alex founded TB12, it was all about bringing the things that they've learned to the world. And so much of what you're talking about is so aligned and particularly with Tom's day job as a quarterback, uh, we talk a lot about being on offense, not on defense. And one of the things I really enjoyed about your talk today and when I read your book is, similarly, it's about going on offense. It's about making choices. And we have control. And we can make many of the choices you've mentioned to take control of our immunity, of our health. And whether that's in an environment today with COVID or something after or beyond, uh, we do have some control. So on behalf of everyone at TB12 and certainly all the viewers, I want to really thank you for your time and very much enjoyed it learned a lot and uh, I appreciate everything you've done. And for those of you who've listened, I can tell you firsthand, Eat to Beat Disease is a great book. I really enjoyed it. And you'll learn a lot more about what he talked about uh, today in the book if you go out and read that as well. But thank you very much. And thank, thank you everyone. You.